Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Swim Brief. This is Chris DeSantis. Um, Swim Brief is brought to you by Jersey Wahoos, a silver medal, maybe soon to be more than silver medal swim club. That's a teaser for you, um, although we don't really know what the standards are in USA Swimming, um, USA Swimming Club in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. I am very obviously, for people who are watching this on YouTube, not in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Um, you can see the beautiful background of my aunt's house in Kure, Denmark. That's uh, K, the O with a slash through it, G-E is how you spell that town name because Danish is a wondrous language that um, is almost never pronounced as it's written on the page. Um, I think primarily to torture uh, non-native speakers seems to be one of the big goals um, over here. Um, but enough about Denmark uh, per se. I, I wanted to record this. I'm doing a sort of solo cast here. I'm actually preparing tonight to speak to a group of coaches and uh, I'm not gonna cover the same content that I'm giving in the speech tonight to coaches. Um, one, for the very obvious reason that there are people that have paid to attend this and um, therefore it would be uh, quite silly of me to then record a free version of it just mere hours before and blast it out onto the internet. Um, but sort of the, the creative juices of what I'm working on tonight has got me focused on a whole nother topic and I thought it might make for a good podcast. So here I am um, recording it. I think at the core of what I'm doing tonight and I will back up a little bit and explain how I got here, is um, I'm going to be taking a bit of an appreciative look at Danish swimming. Um, those of you who listen to the podcast know that I uh, lived and coached in Denmark for a period of about three years, call it almost four years, I guess three and three quarters. Um, you know, what age are you, at you when you stop counting halves and fractions um, of something? But um, I was over here for some time and uh, I've now have nearly six years um, separation from when I left Denmark. And um, one of the great things about time, you know, we don't probably most of us love getting older, but one of the great things about time is um, you gain perspective, right? And um, so part of why uh, I'm giving this talk is because the time and distance between when I was living in Denmark has given me a lot more insight into my time here. And uh, certainly that is sort of the driving principle for the talk tonight, because um, I'm gonna be speaking to a group of Danish coaches and essentially what they're curious about is um, what kind of valuable perspective I have. And uh, I'm really excited to do that. And I, I can honestly say that there's probably many other times in the intervening six years when I wouldn't have been excited to do that. So it's quite serendipitous timing to be able to come over and talk about something like this. And, you know, I spent um, from the time that I agreed uh, to do this to today, um, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about what it is, I would say. And it brought me back to a, a sort of a core principle of positive psychology. And that is um, sort of this method of um, taking appreciative looks at things. And I'll, I'll get into a definition of um, what it means to take a appreciative look. Essentially, um, and you, those of you who've listened to things I've done before, this will sound quite familiar to you. Um, taking an appreciative look is mostly about, um, you know, viewing any kind of situation or person or circumstance or what have you um, and uh, focusing on what's good about it from the start. Um, so instead of uh, taking, it's sort of, I would say, you know, and I, I, I'm hesitating even as I begin, because I think sometimes we uh, go too far in defining uh, positive psychology terms by what, what they're sort of 
expected opposite is. I wouldn't say it's exactly the opposite, but um, it is quite a bit different, distinct, let's say, from taking a critical look at something where you go like, what's wrong? <laughs> what's wrong? This is a bit more of um, what's right. And I thought that was quite important to do. And um, when I say that there are many other times uh, in the intervening six years that I wouldn't have been excited to do this is one reason would be um, at many moments in there, I would have struggled to take an appreciative look because uh, a, uh, I definitely had some really strong emotions um, when I left Denmark, particularly about coaching here. And um, of course, when you, whenever you're dealing with uh, strong emotions, it becomes harder and harder to steer your thought process um, in, in the direction that you may want it to go. And in particular, in this case, I had a lot of negative emotions about, about my departure. I was quite angry, in fact, um, at the time that I left. So, um, you know, uh, anytime I would try to refocus and take sort of an appreciative look and everything, my mind drifted back to um, essentially angry criticisms of um, what it is I was uh, working on. So um, I think it's really important to take an appreciative look at things because um, you can't really begin tackling problems until you know what's working. And this is something I say to everybody that I coach with, um, the athletes that I coach, uh, because so often we are naturally problem focused, right? We can very easily see what's wrong. What do we need to fix? Um, that's kind of stuff comes very, very naturally to uh, people. But if we don't know what's working, if we don't know what's good, then um, often we can be playing essentially a game of whack-a-mole because we will solve one problem and in the process we will cast aside something that works and then we've got a new problem because <laughs> we lost this uh, process that worked for us. Um, and so uh, it's been a, a, a challenge of course um, throughout my coaching career, both for myself and for the people I work with to sort of orient in this direction, because again, people are more naturally problem focused. And anytime you try to steer away from focus on a problem, you risk uh, appearing to be non-empathetic, essentially, right? I think that, um, and then I'll get into this a little bit later, um, why I've always had a bit of a conflicted relationship with appreciative uh, topics in positive psychology is that um, I think, you know, it's definitely an art to do appreciative work with anybody um, because, you know, you will try to steer the thought process towards something um, more positive, more um, what's working well, more what's right. And um, they will have a very natural pull towards what's wrong. And if you appear to be just sort of casting aside, you know, the problems that they have, well, they don't feel um, very seen by you. They don't feel that you're being very empathetic in the first place. And um, that could often cause them to just sort of disengage with whatever else you're trying to do. So, um, and, and that is essentially, I mean, when I say appreciative uh, topics, there is a actual sort of formal process um, within positive psychology um, that's quite popular for uh, using sort of the appreciative thought process. It's called appreciative inquiry. And um, essentially, um, I should say more formally, like an, having an appreciative inquiry summit, which, you know, a, a typical format might be a couple days, you take a big organization, you get 
um, a group of people um, that are sort of all the stakeholders. So let's say in the case of a swim team, you might bring together over two days, every swimmer, every coach, every parent in your organization. And um, you steer them through a process where they have to in little groups and then generally sort of building towards a big group um, session. And I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying the process, um, sort of discuss, you know, what is good about the organization and then start using that as a launching point to think about um, what's possible for the future, like dream a little bit, and then actually um, see if you know you can't get the people in the room to think of some cooperative way to make some of that happen. And um, look, it's one of those things that uh, I, 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 it's not that I don't believe in it. I think it looks absolutely wonderful. I have just never in the uh, 13 years since I graduated um, uh, with my shiny positive psychology degree attempted to do it. I um, have often felt that it's extremely politically laborious within an organization to get something like this together. Like I think probably some of you are listening to this and just going like, oh yeah, okay, Chris. So I'm gonna, you know, like just take two days and all day have the attention of every single swimmer, every single coach, every single parent, or, you know, most um, of those people, like I can't even get, um, can't even get most of the people to read my emails. So I think, um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, it is a really heavy lift for a lot of organizations. And I, when I look at the organizations where it's sort of worked, um, even in the sporting world, it's been really, really, I would say small. I, I, I know some college teams have uh, tried to do it. And in that case, they don't necessarily have to bring in parents as a stakeholder. In fact, I don't think they've tried to. So it's been a pretty simple, you know, like coach, uh, facilitator, athletes, and maybe some other ancillary people within, um, within a college setting and maybe even a single gender program so that um, you don't have to get a lot of people involved. But I have never, um, as I said, I've never tried it. And, um, you know, I think it, it certainly has value, but I think sort of more the spirit of appreciative looks um, are quite a bit better. Um, so again, one of the things that I plan to do tonight, um, and I, I will say, I'm gonna do some, for lack of a better word, bitching about Denmark. And um, I don't shy away from that, even though um, it's not particularly pure positive psychology to do a bunch of complaining. Um, I, uh, I, I have found over time, like I, I was sort of raised, you know, um, to feel a lot of shame around complaining. Uh, and it's something that, you know, like I would, I still kind of have a visceral reaction when other people complain, because I'm thinking like, you know, somewhere deep in my moral structure that they're, they're committing a violation. Um, and, you know, people who follow this probably go like, oh, Chris complains about all sorts of things. Um, you know, and um, that's not to say that many times I didn't feel conflicted about doing so and didn't feel some weird shame, even when I was complaining about something which I was fairly sure I was right about and was definitely worth complaining about. Um, that said, I, I think um, there, there are moments for catharsis, uh, for humanity. And um, I have actually with several uh, teams and groups done extremely sort of cathartic um, constructive, I call them constructive bitch sessions, um, where um, we don't necessarily actually, from that point, in fact, there's no focus put on solving the specific problems, problems, here's that word again, uh, that come out of these things. But sometimes you just need to be able to say, 
Um, I don't know if like, if you're in a uh, organization, you've probably had some moment where you go like, okay, like today's the day I'm gonna let people give me a little feedback on like what's going on. And then you get this flood, right? So sometimes it's good to just um, have a formal process for tightering out some of this stuff um, and understanding that it's, it's okay to complain um, that, that there's a time and place for it rather than just going, well, like, I don't like complaining and uh, I won't tolerate any of it and um, just sort of letting things fester under the surface. In any case, I'm really excited tonight to talk to a group of coaches. I hope that um, this look at some appreciative stuff was helpful to you. Um, greetings from Denmark. I think we'll be back on a normal schedule next week and I look forward to talking to you then.